Groceries cost a whole lot of money right now, so I've been basing all my meals off of what's on sale. The first step of this recipe is to wait for chicken wings to go on sale and then buy as many as you can at a deep, deep discount. If they're less than $2 a pound, chances are you'll have to cut these into flats and drumettes yourself, unless you like eating them whole. You just make a cut in the general area of the joint, bend it backwards so the joint pops out, and then cut through between the bones. You do the same thing for the little wing tip too. These are culinarily worthless as meat. Put them in a plastic container and then put that container in your freezer. I know it's a very food TV host thing to be like, save the leftover chicken parts for stock, but when it comes to wing tips, they have so much bone, skin, and collagen that it's actually good advice, not just an aspirational platitude. You can collect wing tips all year long, even if you only make chicken stock once in the holiday season. Anyway, back to the wings. These need to be seasoned. If you have a salty pre-made spice mix that you love, just shower that over each one. I wanna keep these pretty plain, so I'm gonna do one part salt, one part black pepper, and one half part of coarse granulated garlic. That's one one and one half teaspoon of each, respectively, per pound of wings. Get the seasoning applied as evenly as possible. Doing so requires using a big bowl so that there's lots of room to move everything around. Now you've got chicken juice all over a knife, a cutting board, and a big bowl. Cleaning up after cooking chicken wings is always a pain. That's why I'm making one big batch to last me a long, long time. I only need to do all of this once. This is the part where any ultimate chicken wing guide will tell you to add baking soda and dry brine the wings on a wire rack overnight. That's not necessary here because phase one of this two-part cooking strategy is just a matter of getting the meat to a safe internal temperature. Skin crisping is not yet of concern. Here are your options. One, put the wings in a steamer basket and steam the wings for 10 minutes. This was Alton Brown's favorite wing rendering method back in the Good Eats days. Two, get a big lidded bowl, crack the lid a little bit to vent the steam and microwave them for three to five minutes. I know this sounds wacky at first, but microwaving is really just another way to steam food. Three, put all the wings on a smoker set to 250 for a couple hours. This is a lot slower, but you'll get deep smoke flavor. And four, put all the wings in an oven set to 250 for a couple hours. This gives you the same wide window of doneness that cooks with ADHD might crave, but without the smoker. As soon as they hit 160 degrees Fahrenheit, they're technically safe to eat. You could pull them off right away, but chicken wings taste best at significantly higher temps, especially if you like super tender wings that can be sucked straight off the bone in one swipe. These are also small and irregular that they'll never all be the same exact temp, but the biggest wing should hit at least 170 as all the smaller ones start getting closer to 180. After steaming, smoking, or nuking, the wings have been cooked to a safe temperature. They do look flabby and pale. The whole point of this big batch prep style is to get to this stage and then let the wings cool off completely. You can hold them in the fridge until they're cool enough to seal in freezer bags and then chuck them in the freezer. After that, you have fully cooked homemade chicken wings that are ready to crisp up whenever you want them with no butchery, no dry brining, and no raw chicken cleanup. You just take a bag out of the freezer to defrost it, cut it open, and perform a second cook right before eating. Here are your options for phase two. One, grill them over open flame. The skin gets medium crispy, there's a dark smoky char, and they're perfect for accepting barbecue sauce. You will have to monitor them the whole time to adjust for hot spots, otherwise they can burn. Two, stick them in an air fryer at max power for 20 minutes. The skin gets crispier this way, and an average size wing can go straight from the freezer to the air fryer and still be warm all the way through by the time it's done. Three, these were deep fried in ripping hot 400 degree peanut oil, but I never do this in real life. You wouldn't wanna do this straight from the freezer because any ice crystals would melt and explode in the oil, but if you thaw the wings ahead of time and then blot them dry, this is the way to get the crispiest possible skin. Fourth, and finally, you can finish them in the oven. Under the broiler sounds like a good idea, but be warned that you will have to babysit the batch looking for hot spots, pull the whole tray out, flip each wing individually, and then clean up all the oil splatters. I'd rather do it this way. Preheat your oven as high as it goes, like 450 or 500, and line a baking sheet with parchment paper. Put the wings on an even layer, then put another sheet of parchment on top. Sandwich everything between another sheet pan, and then put that big metal sandwich into the hot oven for 20 minutes. The parchment prevents stickage, the double side sheet tray applies hot metal to both sides so you don't have to flip them halfway into cooking, and it's relatively self-contained so hot chicken fat doesn't pop all over the oven's interior. I'll just toss them in whatever my favorite wing sauce is that day while they're still hot. The store-bought options for sweet and sticky wing sauces are actually pretty good these days, but I don't want to get into the world of wing sauce recipes. The big takeaway here is that you can pre-cook an enormous batch of chicken wings using a steamer, smoker, or a microwave, and then hold on to them until you're ready to cook some a la minute. For me, that means one wing purchase can last months in the freezer. Feeding a weekly wing addiction 
thing, but you could take this same approach, keep all the cooked wings in your fridge for just one day before a big party or a football game, and then have a massive tray of chicken wings on the table in a matter of minutes when it's showtime. I know I'm on a long streak of covering quick basics on this channel, but when ground beef is $5 a pound, my mind's not exactly racing with high concept uses for Chateaubriand. And if you can't bring Beef Wellington to every dinner party, at least you can bring chicken wings to every tailgate. I don't know much about the game, but I did hear Karma is the new player to root for. Go team. Trade has paid to be mentioned at the end of this video, and honestly, this one is an easy sell. I have been a Trade customer for like five years now. It's good for coffee noobs because they can help you figure out what you like, and it's good for coffee diehards because you can get freshly roasted whole beans from local legends across the country. You might hear that and think, Surely, it's prohibitively expensive, but every time I compare the price to local roasters in my area, they're pretty much the same. This week, I got a bag of Peixoto from Trade. Peixoto is local. I could drive half an hour and go pick it up directly from them for about 16 bucks, or I could get it delivered to my house for about 16 bucks. It's hard for me to think of any downsides, honestly. You get a huge variety of coffee to choose from, the product comes from local roasters instead of mega corporations, the price is fair, the packaging is minimal, it's just a compostable red bag. I feel like anyone who regularly drinks good coffee should be subscribed to Trade. Right now you can get a free bag with any subscription purchase by visiting my link. I put it on the screen here and in the description too if you don't want to type it out. Thank you Trade. Bye bye.